I'll continue from where we stopped yesterday. And uh, I just want to keep uh, maintaining the perspective all the time so you know what's going on and, um, and you know where we are. Uh, so first I spoke about classical information in terms of Shannon. And it was all within the context of one person does something generate some messages, then uh, they send it through some kind of channel, and then another person has the trouble of identifying what the message was, even when it's up as noise. And we derive this mutual information as the main quantity there. And then I said, let's, let's, do, let's discuss a little bit the basics of quantum mechanics so that we can apply that to, uh, to upgrade classical information to quantum information. And what we did yesterday is we only did uh, basically the upgrade of Shannon's uh, scenario and what I want to do today is continue beyond that and say there is actually an awful lot more that you can do for with quantum states you don't need to just communicate classical messages you can try to communicate whole quantum states with that so in a sense what we did yesterday is really um, uh, quantum using non-orthogonality of quantum states uh, to see how to compress information and we arrived at this whole level bound as being the analog of the mutual information of Shannon's and now of course we're going to say that's a very limited thing because what you want to say ultimately is maybe the string of states themselves you want to maybe preserve the states you don't care whether one state encodes yes another one no you really want the state itself and you want the uh, coherence between the orthogonal states to be preserved and then of course this is outside of Shannon's scenario and you cannot do much about it um, so I think what I intend to cover and I don't know how far we'll get but um, certainly uh, quantum um, cryptography is an obvious one that I kept mentioning is the main main um, motivation for actually using non-orthogonal states for communication even though uh, at first sight they seem to give you a lower channel capacity somehow they're actually good in terms of secrecy in terms of security uh, then I think you have the standard protocols there that, that are very, very much related to one another so of course you you've gathered by now that I discuss various physical issues within this as well so it's not only going to be that I'll, I'll talk about the topics like uh, locality, non-locality that, that, that we really only touched on uh, yesterday and the decompositions of density matrices, matrices and what I call proper and improper mixtures and all of these things are very much related to all of these issues so quantum crypto and then, and then we go into things like that coding again um, uh, this one, this one uh, both of these protocols in a sense still communicate um, still communicate uh, classical information but somehow they uh, this one, I mean the first one can but it doesn't have to use entanglement but the second one certainly relies on entanglement so you're not changing the fact that you want to communicate classical information but you are really you are really changing the fact that your channel is just like a classical noise of some sort now you've got a quantum channel there genuinely that, that, that doesn't have any analog again in channel sense and now you can all guess that the next upgrade is let's make the channel quantum in the sense of entanglement but let's also communicate quantum states on top of it and that's actually teleportation so I'm adding kind of bits to it to make it more and more uh, complicated um, and of course within all of these within all of these issues what's going to emerge ultimately is this uh, notion of entanglement um, and of course we'll all, we've already talked about it but at some stage I want to go a little bit more formally to that and, and show you all the ins and outs and bells inequalities and discuss the modern version bells inequalities are very old fashioned in many ways and I want to upgrade it to, to the witnesses of entanglement and all of these notions there so there's, a, there's, there's quite a lot of interesting things there um, so the main point so far is, is really that um, that classically what you would call um, sorry I keep thinking of you now classically uh, what you call uh, what you call um, a bit of information uh, sorry I'm smiling because Leo said he could not make it to this lecture today 
and then he said he was looking forward to watching the Hollywood movie version of the lectures, where Brad Pitt plays me. <laughs> Anyhow, classically you've got zeros and ones there, and you haven't got anything in between. So they're discrete, there is no continuity. And, and when you talk about qubits, of course, then, then you argue that any, any combination of zero and one is possible. And at some very basic level, this is it. I mean, this is all there is to it. And all the other things I talk about are derivatives of that. They're really consequences of that. You may want to invert the picture and say, no, it's the uncertainty that's the main thing. And then the superposition is a consequence of that. Fine. But we cannot determine which way around this is. I mean, they are all kind of at, at a very similar level in some sense. Um, so, so this guy now, of course, has infinitely many possibilities. And it looks like you can encode infinite amount of information into a bit. But as we saw yesterday, again, and that was the main point of how I was bound, you can actually encode at most a bit of information. In general, you can encode less. And it's not actually the encoding part, because in terms of encoding, if you can control your alphas and betas well, you can really prepare any of these states. So you do have infinitely many messages in a qubit. But of course, the poor Bob guy on the other side has to read the message. And the decoding then becomes impossible. You can't get more than one bit of that out. So somehow we get this, um, we get this thing that Holemo uh, is always less than or equal uh, to what you would call um, classical Shannon's um, bound. And they are only equal. There's only one case in which they are equal. So I'm telling you about this because that's a way of talking about classical quantum to classical transition. This is only, uh, this is only equal, actually, if, um, if all of your messages commute with one another. So being written in the same basis is actually, um, is actually uh, the classical domain. So if everything that, um, that Alice sends, all of these symbols, can be perfectly discriminated with one another, they themselves don't have to be pure states. They don't have to be zeros and ones. But as long as they are diagonal in the same basis, then actually what goes, what comes back is your usual classical mutual information. So you would call this some kind of classical communication. It's exactly the same as all goes through. But in general, you get less. And the interesting thing is, um, then of course, um, why should I be doing that? Why should I go for something that's not as good as this? And then of course that motivates, that motivates the quantum cryptography side of things. So let me tell you a little bit about, uh, about that. Again, most of you have seen this. Um, um, so the idea is somehow that non-orthogonality becomes an advantage because it also deters an eavesdropper from that. Uh, though it does reduce quite severely your rate of communication. Not just because of that, but because on top of it you have to follow a certain protocol to avoid eavesdropping. So the usual, the usual scenario is that, uh, this again was done by Shannon, interestingly enough, before, uh, before his uh, information theory. In fact, that's how he derived information theory, because he started thinking about uh, secret communications a few years before that. So um, I guess this was the World War II, and it was exciting to think about how to be secret. But it was actually important uh, to think about these things, and lots of these things developed in the late 30s and, and 40s, of course. Um, so his, his logic was, was the following. Alice has a message. Again, it's all in terms of bits, obviously, because any message you can translate into sequences of zeros and ones. And basically, Alice has some kind of text. There's all sorts of fancy jargon developed by crypto uh, makers and breakers and analysts, whatever you call them. And it basically is something like this. You have text, and you have to have a key to encode this text. And the key has to have some properties. That's Shannon's result again. If you want, if you want absolute secrecy, then the key has to have basically three properties. So he, key, of course, is another sequence of, uh, of zeros and ones, if you like. And you're going to encrypt the message with the key, and then send it uh, as a cryptogram 
uh, to Bob, who will have to undo this and read the message. Uh, the key has to have the following properties. It has to be genuinely random. And you know, whenever anyone says genuinely random, we physicists start to smile, okay? Because that's what we talk about 90% of the time in quantum mechanics. Because we know that classical physics is never genuinely random. So already this is a dodgy assumption. You can probably shoot it down just based on the fact that nothing is really genuinely random if the universe is classical. But I, I'm not even going to go into that, okay? Not now. The second one is that the key is as long as the message. This ensures that you don't use the key, the same key, a number of times here. Which actually stated in the number three that you should not use the same key for the next communication either. So you should not use the key within one text, but you should not use the same key when you send the next text either. Because then someone could use what's known as the frequency attack and start to look at the correlations between these keys because you keep using the same key over and over again. And if they detect what's the most frequent letter, then they know you're communicating E, whatever comes out, and so on. So they can use this frequency analysis, which is the commonest way of, of breaking classical keys. Um, so basically, the three conditions, genuinely random, as long as, at least as long as the text, and never use it again. Just once. Generate another key, use it again. If you have these three conditions, Shannon says you're unconditionally, unconditionally secure. And, uh, and, and how do you do this? You, you have this binary, you know, modular two, two addi addition of these guys to encrypt. Uh, so cryptogram is really just summation of these guys where one plus one is zero and so on. So you just sum them up basically. It's very nice and simple. And this guy is now sent to Bob, who, who receives this. Um, and of course, the, and this is the crux of the whole problem. Bob needs to have the same key to unravel the message backwards to do the binary addition. Let's grant this uh, to Bob. So Bob has got the, you know, one, one, whatever I wrote there, zero, one, one, zero, one. And then Bob again does uh, binary addition modulo two, and he of course has to recover the same uh, text that Alice sent, because this is a reversible operation. Um, and this is all fine now. And, and of course now the, 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 the tricky, the bottleneck of this, the most problematic thing, if you think you have a very good random number generator and you're pretty happy about it and you think you, you can restrain yourself from using the message again, then the main problem really is the, is the key having to be distributed between Alice and Bob. So in order for me to communicate secretly, I have to already have communicated secretly the key. And this is the chicken and egg problem. I mean, so I, I just generated exactly the same problem by going through this. I didn't really solve anything because now I need to somehow communicate the key. And the question is, how do we generate uh, the common key between, between Alice and Bob? Um, and, uh, and not only do you generate the common key, but without anyone else having a copy of this key. Of course, that's the same, that's the same, that's the same problem. And, and, the idea, and the idea is now really that, uh, that, Alice, and, that Alice uses non-orthogonal states to encode zeros and ones. And I'll show you this first protocol very briefly. Um, and some, I mean, most of you, again, have probably seen something like that. So Bennett and Brassard um, came up with, uh, with, uh, with this protocol uh, that involves four non-orthogonal states. So what they, um, what they said is, I'm either going to use the Z basis of my qubit uh, or the X basis. Uh, and I'm going to choose randomly between the two. I'll toss a coin and I'll choose these guys. Actually, it doesn't really matter that it's perfectly random. As long as you're not choosing completely deterministically, it's fine. You could be biased. So you don't have to have a perfect uh, random number generator. And then here, I have the choice of using 0 and 1, which are the eigenstates in the Z basis. Or I have the choice here of using plus and minus. And plus, of course, is 0 plus 1. So, so that's where the non-orthogonality non comes in. 
and uh, one is uh, and minus is zero minus one. So I'm using four states. I still have one qubit, so of course they cannot be all perfectly distinguished. And the main idea is that is that because they are non-orthogonal, Alice cannot read them. And this actually um, is based on, on another result uh, that came before that, probably influenced this a little bit as well, which is this famous no cloning thing in quantum mechanics, which I only introduce as an aside, because it's a nice, a nice, a nice way of looking at these things. So no cloning says, um, so these are, x number of different ways of talking about the superposition. All of these are consequences of that. But this is a nice one because it has an information theoretic flavor and that's why it, uh, it was published in Nature. It's a, it's, it's a mathematically trivial result. It was probably known to uh, von Neumann 100 years ago, so there's nothing uh, glamorous about it. But because you're casting it in an, within an interesting setting, somehow it acquires a, a whole new meaning on its own. So this guy says, if you have, if you have two non-orthogonal states, of course, if you have more, it gets even worse. But if you have even two just non-orthogonal states, then you cannot create a perfect copy of that unless you know which of the two states you have. Very much like the scenario we had yesterday with distinguishing two non-orthogonal states. So if you could clone, then you could distinguish them. But because we know that we cannot distinguish, we know we can, you cannot clone. But it's a, there's another simple, simple way of doing that. So basically, the, the statement is like this. Imagine, imagine that, that this is the system, and imagine that this is the clone. And, and so the least I have to be able to do is copy 0 into 0 and copy 1 into, into 1. This would be like classical copy. This I'm allowed to do. So basically, I want a process where this goes into itself, because 0 really stays as 0. And I want to flip 0 into 1. And you say, yeah, great, control not. Let's call the control not gate. This exists. Yes, it does exist. There is no problem with that. But as soon as you step outside of this, any other state that's non-classical, any superposition, like alpha 0 plus beta 1, you also want to go into alpha 0 plus beta 1. But of course, it's not going to do that. It's going to go into an entangled state. And here I'm using a simple property of quantum mechanics called linearity. So whatever happens to one state and whatever happens to another state, I need to, the linear combination behaves in exactly the same way. There is no extra bit that I need to add there. They just independently add up. So quantum mechanics is nice and linear. Actually, like quite a lot of basic physics, laws of physics uh, that are linear. Gr modular gravity uh, that, that is giving us, I guess, lots of trouble as a result as well. But lots of basic laws have this kind of property of linearity. So, so what this is going to go to is in exactly into alpha 0, 0, beta 1, 1. And, and this is not equal to, which you can show very easily, to, to, to the clone to two copies of the same guy. So if you, can, if you can faithfully clone the basis, which is the minimum requirement, you've got to be, do, be able to do that, then nothing else can be faithfully cloned. And this is this no cloning theorem in quantum mechanics. Very simple. People say this, this is because of unitarity. You can relax it. Anything linear, so CP maps in other words, this is very general. It looks as though I'm doing control not, and that's a unit doesn't have to be. You can imagine any CP map attempting to do this, and it cannot do it for exactly the same, the same reason as this. So you cannot clone. So suddenly you see that the eavesdropper doesn't have this choice of, uh, of cloning. Um, and again, curiously, it's, it's, another, it's another interesting point, which you will see a bit later on is that if you could clone, it's what I said yesterday, you don't only damage quantum mechanics, you destroy the whole quantum mechanics. You actually start to affect other areas of physics. So you could violate the second law if you could clone, because you could extract more work than the entropy you generate in the environment. That's already in von Neumann's book in 1928. It's a beautiful cycle in which he derives the density matrix by requiring consistency with thermodynamics. It's one of the chapters, and I really encourage you to do to, to read it. Beautifully written. 
uh, very physics-y. You know, this guy has a reputation of being a hardcore mathematician, but actually he is uh, one of us really, uh, in many ways. And, uh, and, um, and if you assume that you could clone, you could also communicate instantaneously using entanglement. And I said yesterday that you sh cannot do that as far as quantum mechanics. It's a mystery why you cannot do it. But if you violate this, if you say, imagine I could clone, then I will show you a protocol that actually communicates faster than any speed you like. It's instantaneous. So I kill relativity immediately, even though relativity, like I said, has nothing to do with quantum mechanics. And it's really interesting that they are connected in this, in this nice way. So now, what do all these, so I'll talk a little bit more about it. Anyway, as far as we are concerned, this now deters eavesdropper from, from gaining information uh, perfectly. Um, and and what, what Alice really does is Alice now generates, uh, Alice needs to prepare a bunch of qubits to send a message. And the first thing she chooses, so z classical 0 and 1 are going to be encoded, either 0 is going to be 0 or 0 is going to be plus, two non-orthogonal states, and 1 is either going to be 1 or it's going to be minus here. So what she first chooses is the, is the basis choice. You know, tosses a coin every time. It's a little bit like any protocol, like Bell's inequalities or whatever else. And she has a sequence, you know, x, x, z, x. This is the basis I'm going to use, basically. You know? so, so this is Alice choosing these things. And then, and then she says, OK, if I want to communicate 0 here, that means I'm going to be preparing. This bit now is deterministic because she knows the message she wants to communicate to Bob. Here is the message: zero one zero zero one one zero. Okay. So basically, she says in in the x basis, um, zero is encoded as as plus. So this qubit is prepared as as plus and will be sent off to Bob. The assumption is that there is no noise in the channel, or there is very little noise, and you know how little this is, 10 to minus 5 error rate, for example. Something that you tolerate and you don't mind. Um, and I say, I have x, but I'm communicating 1, that's minus, and actually so on, right? So I don't have to, so in, in z, if I'm communicating 0, that really is 0, and so on, OK? You can work out the rest of that. And, and now the assumption is, let's say it's really faithfully received by Bob. There is no interference in the middle. Um, and, and the question is, what, you know, what is he going to do now? Uh, and Bob now also randomly chooses the basis in which to measure. And you can see that by doing this, he already kills half of the communication because he's not going to match, he's not going to match this, uh, this side of Alice's um, in more than 50% of the time if they exchange many of these guys. So, you know, let's say he tosses a coin and he says, I'm going to perform an X measurement here. So they, they don't communicate prior to this at all, other than to arrange that this is the protocol. We all know what the protocol is like. So they don't, they don't need to really exchange anything about these messages <laughs> and so on. Of course, they need to, you know, talk about the timing and all the other experimental issues, but nothing to do with communication. So let's say he now mismatches here, because he doesn't anyway know what Alice is doing. And you know now here x and so on. There's a sequence on Bob's side. Um, and now what they do is they want to test whether there is an eavesdropper in between or not. So here you cannot do anything about the eavesdropper if the eavesdropper is it. If you detect that there is a disturbance higher than 10 to minus 5, whatever you're happy to tolerate, then, then of course all you can do is abandon the key and start all over again. So no one can prevent eavesdropping. Uh, but of course, so, so basically, if an eavesdropper wants to prevent you from communicating, they can always do that. This is true classically of quantum. But if you put yourself in the position of the eavesdropper, it's not in her interest to prevent you from communicating, because she wants to hear what you have to say. Okay? She wants to drop a bomb on you, and then see what you're telling the headquarters after the bomb has been dropped. This is, as you can see, a real-world example. It's happened many times. So basically, you do want the communication. You don't want them to detect that you are that you are eavesdropping so hard that they stop talking 
uh, completely. Um, but of course, on the other hand, the eavesdropper doesn't want to disturb too much because then you will detect that it's above the threshold. And so the, the question always in cryptography is how much can I get, but never to disturb more than what these guys are prepared to tolerate. And you know what they, what they tolerate in general. That's public knowledge in many ways. So what they do now is they say, they say let's waste half of the ensemble. They can even choose this randomly so that, so that basically the eavesdropper really doesn't know prior which of them they will choose. But for us now, let's say they choose the half, the top half. Of course, they wouldn't be doing it like that. They would just, they would just pick up the phone. They can use the local radio station. Anyone can now listen. Doesn't matter. And they would say, let's choose the second, the fifth, the tenth, the seventeenth, and let's compare our results. Okay. So what Alice does is Alice starts to announce the basis. So this is going to be thrown away because everyone now knows the basis. But they don't care because they're going to be using the guys they don't announce now, from then on. You see, in, in, in that way. So this is now only used for, for the purposes of, of establishing the error rate. Are they happy with that or not? Is there an eavesdropper or not? So Alice says, in the first, in the first instance, I actually prepared uh, plus in the, in the X basis, obviously. Um, so, and, and Bob then says, oh, I actually had the same basis here by accident, so I must have measured plus as well. And if Bob doesn't have plus there, here is one wrong outcome. It's either noise or it's an eavesdropper, but who cares if there are too many of these guys who just don't proceed with this kind of stuff. You see, it's very nice. And then now, so if they coincide, great. Then they go to the next, and then Alice says, I've got X. Bob says, I've got Z. Never mind. Let's throw it away because we're not going to coincide anyway with or without an eavesdropper. Okay, just by chance. Let's go to the next one. So they only choose the ones where they coincide. And from, you know, if, if, if you have one billion transmissions per second, then you don't mind wasting half a billion to establish this. And basically, you get a good statistics, the error rate. So you can estimate the error rate. And if the error rate is small, and if you really picked out random guys, so you know that you know that the rest is also fine, unless the eavesdropper is really super conspiratorial and has some superpowers, then actually, then 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 these guys are now fine as the key. And what's going to be the key? The key is going to be only those guys where they coincide, because then they know they have the same result, but they don't announce the result any longer because they don't need to check the error rate. So in this case, in the key case, Alice said, I measured, I prepared in Z. Bob said, oh, I also measured in Z. And of course, they don't say, they'd be stupid if they announced what they measured. It's either 0 or 1, and no one knows it. Only two of them now know it. Even though the whole communication now is it's over a public channel. Here they say, oh, we are not in the same basis. Let's not use this guy as the key. So you can see that half of it goes on, on determining the error rate. Another half goes because we have no clue. We, we just didn't coincide. We just chose randomly. So at best, quarter of your guys is going to be, you, I mean, that's still a large number. Quarter of a billion is still a billion if you're a physicist in many ways. So basically, it's a large number. And, and, um, and so now they proceed with that. So it's a very simple statement. you know. And so, Really, the ingenuity, and if you if you you know if you start browsing the web and look for looking for papers, the ingenuity lies now in doing the best you can as the eavesdropper, not to go above the, the error rate and maximize your mutual information. So now we're talking about three mutual informations. Okay, it's like the good, the bad, and the ugly scenario. So basically, you've got the Alice, the Bob, and the eavesdropper. And you know that this mutual information tells you about their communication, how correlated they are. And you know that this mutual information is actually what tells Eve, what gives Eve the info, how much, how, what is the rate at which Eve understands Alice's message. And if this guy exceeds that guy, you should not communicate. There's no way you can distill something, something useful. So the eavesdropper wants to achieve as much as possible here 
but not to disturb too much. And of course, if you really have a very low error rate, then the e-sorber can't do that. The e can't get too much mutual information without introducing, without introducing extra disturbance. So I think basically that's all there is to quantum cryptography. And there is, there is another scenario which uses entanglement, which I will mention a, a bit later on. But basically, it's reduced exactly to the same type of mathematics. You can map it one for one. Uh, there is a subtle difference in another issue there, but you know it works for exactly the same reason, and, and you, can, you can follow the protocol in exactly the same way. So what I'm going to do uh, is, uh, is uh, start on the, on, the, on, on the next bit, which is dense coding. Because that guy now genuinely has to uh, has to uh, involve entanglement, and then and then what we're going to do, uh, uh, hopefully also in the in the in the next part, is talk a little bit about the, the things that I mentioned before. Why you cannot communicate instantaneously? And we'll try to weave all of these things uh, with CP maps together with the no cloning, just to show you how tightly uh, neat the whole structure is. Which which is always interesting. So dense coding, uh, dense coding says um, that the gain in communicating classical information with quantum um, mechanics is really that for one bit, for one qubit, um, you can actually get two classical bits of information. And of course, you know. You go back and you say you've spent three days on showing us that you cannot get more than one bit out of one quantum bit. I mean, that's what Holler's bound says. Now suddenly you're telling me that you will violate that. And again, this is only because I'm allowing the channel to be entangled. There, I really didn't allow any kind of extra entanglement. So that's why you can do it, not because there's any magic there. And this conforms to the Holler bound as much as anything else because entanglement is between two quantum mechanical bits so I do have actually two bit, two quantum bits it's just that I'm manipulating only one to um, to send a message and so the scenario is I think most of you again know it I can do this very quickly so I have this entangled pair this is an artist impression of course of an entangled pair and, and if you imagine some kind of maximally entangled state 0 0 plus 1 1 uh, between Alice and Bob um, so this has to be shared prior to the whole thing, and uh, and uh, and and now the trick is that Alice is only going to affect her own qubit. This is another way of talking about spooky action at the distance, in some sense. Uh, that by acting on, and this is a much nicer one than all the nonsense that you have to read about historically. There's really lots of junk and lots of philosophy and so on, but it boils down to something like this. Um, so the thing is that Alice can affect only and will only affect her own qubit, but she will access all four orthogonal states of the two qubits. So that's the spooky part. I'm acting here but I seem to be accessing the whole Hilbert space of two qubits. That also now seems to contradict the fact that I keep claiming this is all local. And again, you will see what I mean by that a bit, uh, a bit more carefully. So what Alice does is Alice says, uh, I have four possible, th so how, how is she going to send four messages, which is two bits? Log of four is two, I mean, in, in terms of Shannon. So she, she will either do nothing, which is represented as, a, as, a, as identity, Operation, or she will she will flip zero to one and one to zero, which is known as the Pauli sigma x operator, or she will do a phase uh, gate again something that doesn't. These two are classical operations, but this one is genuinely quantum in the sense that it changes uh, changes one to so sigma z if you like sends zero into zero and uh, one into minus one. And sigma y is, is nothing but a combination of sigma z and sigma x, or the other way around with a minus sign, whatever is the dimension, never mind. And if, you, if, you, if Alice now says, I apply one of these guys, and each of them represents a message, you know, this is message 1, message 2, message 3, and message 4, can actually Bob 
Uh, and, and then she sends this qubit to Bob. And now Bob has two qubits. And the two qubits are in one of the four orthogonal states. Uh, 0, 0, plus, minus, 1, 1. These are the two states. Or 0, 1, plus, minus, 1, 0, which are the bell. You know, we call them bell states. Um, then all Bob has to do is make a projective measurement. It's now easy to discriminate because there are four orthogonal states. And he's got access to both qubits now. Bob has to make a projective measurement and he can immediately read, read out what Alice did, which of the messages she sent. So you know, if he gets a, if he gets a state a 0, 0, minus 1, 1, she knows that Alice must have applied sigma z because they started with this state. She must have kicked in minus sign here somehow. And that means she was sending me message M3, which is the main message or whatever we had it as before. Okay, so this is, this is one of the four messages. Uh, and it seems now that, that he can recover two bits, I mean, he can recover two bits, while Alice only sent one bit. But this bit was already pre-entangled in a quantum mechanical way. And this, again, is really another statement of, of, say, of saying this, this is what's, what's unusual about, about entanglement, that you can do things like that. And yet again, in spite of all of these things, I will show you that, that you really cannot communicate um, uh, instantaneously, even with, uh, with powers like this. So this is this dense coding. And in fact, if you now say, what happens if they share a mixed state, not the maximally entangled state? This has been analyzed. All that happens is that your resulting four states will not be four bell states. But there will be some states, row 1, row 2, row 3, and row 4, with equal probabilities. Let's say she's sending each of these messages with equal probability, one quarter. Bob now has to apply a CP map, a POVM, to discriminate these guys. And we actually know the best that he can do. It's called a whole level bound. So I can quantify the dense coding with any state here simply by telling you that the number of bits that they can communicate in this way is S of rho, rho being the average of quarter of this plus this plus this plus this, minus one quarter of the average of the entropies of rho i, the four of these guys. And here it is, the capacity of dense coding for any state. And some people say this is how you can quantify entanglement. Maximally entangled states will give you maximum capacity of two bits, but if you go down, they will give you lesser and lesser capacity. And that's a way of measuring the entanglement, for example. So this is uh, capacity for dense coding. And so on. There are a few more things to be said about it, but I think it's a perfect actually time to stop. And I will make again, as usual, a 10 minute break, and then we continue with this. It's OK? Okay, uh, so I noticed yesterday that the footballers all wait for the cameras to leave the pitch before they start, and I think we have a similar arrangement here, which is very good. Um, how life uh, mirrors football, in other words. Uh, what I want to say is just a, a side remark here. It was a very good question, actually, um, uh, which, which asked, what if Alice and Bob here uh, don't share any entanglement, but they have a classically correlated, like a separable state, what we talked about yesterday. So what if Alice and Bob allow themselves a state? Um, uh, so basically, let's, let's start it like this. It's easy to see logically. Alice has some density matrix, <coughs> and so does Bob. And this would be like really a, a classical state in, in the sense of not even being correlated. Um, and, and, and if you correlate each of these eyes, and if you allow different eyes with some probabilities, then by now we know that this means introducing correlations between A and B. But no entanglement. Um, so this is, this is uh, what I'm saying is that this is not the same as, as a state, you know, R, I, R, I. That's a really highly entangled state, depending on these P's, I suppose. But this really has no entanglement, okay, disentanglement. But correlate. So I'm allowing 
prior correlation between Alice and Bob, but the correlation in the Shannon sense, not the correlation in the, in the quantum sense. And the question is, can I do better than one bit of information, which is the classical? And you cannot. So it's another way of, of again, conforms to, to the fact that this quantifies entanglement nicely, because states that are not entangled indeed give you, give you only one bit. They don't give you anything extra on top of it. And if you're interested in that, um, there is a paper by, I wrote a paper in which, it's, 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 as I was saying before, it's a paper that leads to lots of citations. I'm not sure if this one did, but I, I, I wrote it by giving a few results and the rest that I couldn't prove, I just didn't prove it. Uh, and, then, and then I met a, a very, a very, very smart guy who effectively proved the rest of it, I think, uh, uh, the following evening. And he wrote um, uh, a beautiful, he did his PhD uh, at Oxford as well. But this is something like PRA 2000 or 2001 or something like that. But basically, if you check Gary Bowen, you will see the full analysis with any mixed state between Alice and Bob and computing this kind of guy. So, so it really is the difference between no entanglement and entanglement. It's entanglement here that gives you extra power, one to one. Uh, and the same can be said about the next, uh, the next protocol. So this protocol was the one that, uh, because of, uh, I suppose mainly because of its name, but of course it has a lot to teach us again about, uh, about quantum mechanics, it, it always generates lots of publicity. Um, and, um, and it's an extension of dense coding. I mean, mathematically it's a trivial thing. It's again a beautiful piece of physics which involves almost no mathematics but carries a lot of meaning. I mean, that's what we like as physicists. We don't want to calculate brainlessly in, in, in some sense. And so the only thing you have now is an extra qubit. And this is the one where this extra qubit is the qubit you want to faithfully uh, transmit. So Alice receives something. Uh, and then there's this channel which is maximally entangled. Uh, and, uh, and Alice now says, I'd like, so these two guys here belong to Alice. Here's Bob with his own qubit on the other side of the universe, if you like. And, uh, and basically, you, you, you'd like Alice to transmit this guy and this guy to appear on Bob's side after, uh, after some time without Alice really, uh, in some sense, having to go over and bring this qubit to Bob, or send it to Bob. So Alice, of course, can always send the qubit to Bob in the same way that she sends it as far as dense coding is concerned, but the question is, can you do it without sending uh, quantum states? Because they're fragile, something can happen to them along the way. So it's better if I didn't have to do that and just rely on the, on the prior uh, correlation or entanglement that I have. And, and so the beautiful lessons here are, of course, initially you think that this is impossible in the same way that you think many other things should not be possible. Um, and, and the impossibility was, was there because if you don't think about this in terms of entanglement, then we already know from the first uh, part of the course in, in, in some sense that you should not be able to um, establish what state you have unless you have the full information about the preparation of the state. So if someone gives Alice a state of a qubit, some state uh, A0 plus B1, then Alice cannot estimate really A and B in any reliable way because we have a bunch of non-orthogonal states. She cannot discriminate them um, at all. So um, unless she has zillion copies of this and she can do zillion measurements and then get the statistics and then get the mod A squared and the mod B squared and so on. Um, so, so, so initially people thought, well, this can't be done because in order for Alice to send the state to Bob uh, or to communicate the state to Bob without sending it, she needs to estimate the state herself, but this can't be done. And then she would have to pick up the phone and tell Bob, you know, prepare a with the amplitude 0 0.73 and B with whatever is the remaining part. But of course, if you engage entanglement, then you can overcome this difficulty. So it's again related to the fact that, uh, that you cannot estimate the quantum state um, perfectly well, unless, of course, you use extra quantum resources in this sense. 
So now, um, how does this protocol go? And of course, um, that, that was the major surprise, that with entanglement somehow you don't even need to estimate it, but it can appear on the other side. So neither Alice nor Bob ultimately know what Psi was, but it doesn't matter. Bob knows that he's got whatever Alice had to start with, even though neither of them know what it is, which means to faithfully transmit something. Uh, and, um, and it's the same now in the sense that what Alice needs to do is perform four different measurements on, on her qubits. It's like in dense coding, four different messages. And then she's going to communicate which of these four messages she measured. And then Bob will have to do something to his qubit upon, upon receiving the classical. So all they share is a classical channel in addition. Um, and, and it's very simple. I mean, you can see it in a simple sense just by rewriting this state. So if you write A0 plus B, one, and you have the channel. Um, so you have to remember that the first two, this guy and this guy here belong to Alice, if you like, and the, and the last guy is the qubit that Bob has. All you have to do now is really rewrite this guy in a slightly different basis. And, uh, and because otherwise we would stay here until midnight if I didn't have a shorthand notation, I'm going to label this in the usual uh, notation of uh, phi plus minus and uh, psi plus minus. And if I go back there, all this requires really is to, is to expand this first, you know, 0, 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, and so on. Okay, B, 1, 0, 0, and B, 1, 1, 1. And now you're saying, well, why, why don't I now expand these guys in a different basis? And that's going to be the basis that I wrote uh, there. And then I perform the measurement in this Bell basis here. So this is Bell measurement. And then I get some outcome. But you will see when I do this already, you will see why this works. It's, it's really a remarkable, uh, remarkable identity in many ways. So if I write 0, 0, this 0, 0 is nothing but phi plus plus phi minus. So if I add up these two states, this plus and minus will cancel this component and all I'm left with is 0, 0. I'm ignoring the normalization as, as usual. It should be divided by root 2. This guy is likewise psi plus plus psi minus. This guy is psi plus minus psi minus and so on. You can phi plus uh, minus phi minus. And then I group together all the all the phi plus terms, all the phi minus terms, all the psi plus, and basically after five lines of, uh, of expanding this, what I get is the following, and I guess that's the interesting thing. Phi plus, this is now on Alice's side, the two qubits on Alice's side. What, but notice what I'm doing is just mathematics. This is all in my head or on the board. This is not, not, no one has to do anything to achieve this in reality. That's what's interesting about it, actually. Um, and, and what uh, Bob has now is A0 plus B1. And if it's phi minus, what Bob has is A0 minus B1. And if it's psi plus, what Bob has is A1 plus B0. And if it's psi minus, what Bob really has is the fourth state, A1 minus B0. And you can see that all of these four states on both sides look remarkably like one another. Uh, the first component is the state that Alice has already. So in some sense here, you've teleported the state without even doing anything. Um, and uh, so to put it properly now, this all has a normalization one half. There's one quarter probability for each of these outcomes to happen. Um, so now what Alice does is a measurement in this basis, and she gets with one quarter probability one of these four guys. If she gets the first guy, she phones Bob up and says, your qubit is already in the state that mine was. You don't need to do anything. If she gets this guy, she says to him, you have to apply sigma z. So Bob does sigma z, and sigma z converts this state into a0 plus b1, which is the original state. If she, gets, uh, if she gets this guy, what Bob has to do is sigma x, because he has to exchange 0 and 1. And of course, the final one is a combination of sigma x and sigma z, which is what I called sigma y previously. 
So deterministic, even though Alice's measurement outcome is random, and she cannot control which of the course she gets, she can always tell Bob what to do to correct the state at the end and get exactly the right state um, when he finishes the protocol, without knowing what the state is, either of the two participants. So it's very simple, and it relies exactly on the same logic of sending one classical bit, one quantum bit, and getting two classical bits in some in some sense. Um, and I think there, you know, is this? I mean, how mysterious is this? Is uh, is of course questionable. I mean, it's, it's you know, it's been implemented many times experimentally, with small number, you know, either between two atoms or between two nuclei in NMR, or between you know photons. Uh, two meters apart from each other and so on. So we don't have anything more spectacular really than that. Uh, but I think most people believe that it really just is a question of effort, uh, you know, teleporting two atoms and three atoms and so on. So it's very interesting. Um, of course, when you talk about it in the public, the first question is, can you teleport human beings? You know, when, when can I enter the teleportation protocol and be on the other side? And then you say, well, you know, uh, given that even this cannot be done properly with unit efficiency with a single two-level system, then unless you want to look like uh, Jeff Goldblum in the Fly movie, or even worse than that, then you shouldn't really volunteer yourself, I suppose, for this part. The second question is just interesting what drives the public. Frequently uh, not so dissimilar to what uh, drives us, I suppose, we're all human. The second question is, would it really be me on the other side? So basically the main thing here is that again, we know that I cannot clone. So once Bob ends up on the other, uh, on the other side with the right qubit, you notice that Alice has absolutely no information whatsoever. If you look at the state of this guy at the end of the protocol, it's part of a maximally entangled state of two qubits which means that its state is, when you, when you trace out one qubit, maximally mixed. So Alice teleported the information to Bob, the quantum state, but she's left with absolutely nothing at the end to estimate the state. It's its maximally mixed state. And this is, this is also can be seen that this has to be like this because of no cloning. If she retained this guy, that's effectively cloning. And we know we cannot clone quantum mechanically no matter what you do, no matter how much of the universe you happen to engage in the rest of the protocol. So then the question is, you destroyed the original of a human being, and you created uh, the, the person on the, other, on the other side. So is this really me? You know? Did you just teleport my body, or do I also have my soul on the other side? <laughs> And the most interesting answer to this was given by Asher Perez, one of the guys, one of the six authors on that paper, who says, no, 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 I only teleport the soul, not the body. Because the wave function is the guy that gets across, not the matter. It's really interesting. So quantum mechanics really just, I mean, if you call the wave function the soul, <laughs> and being really quiet. So these atoms stay as they are, it's just that this guy here assumes the same state as that guy. Is that the same guy? And of course, every physicist would say, if I cannot in any way discriminate this guy by any experimental procedure, if whatever I do to this guy, it's going to give me the same outcomes as I do to this guy, then they've got to be the same state. I mean, it, every atom is the same as every other atom. There's indistinguishability in quantum mechanics. So yes, teleporting the soul, adds up to teleporting a human being. I think that's the, the Asher Perez uh, interesting answer. And of course now you can, you can think whatever you like about this and whether this is feasible and whether there is something else to it. But it's, it's really an interesting protocol, how everything, all of these bits, in many ways, uh, fit together. Okay. Now it looks really uh, nice and, uh, and mysterious that, that you can do all of these interesting things. And, and again, why is this not instantaneous? Because you can see that at this stage, even though it looks like you've teleported something, you didn't teleport until you communicated, or until Alice communicated the result to Bob. And this has to be done by, by a classical channel, and that means there has to be some kind of um, something traveling at most at the speed of light between the two people. 
So, so even, it fits even that aspect together that a classical communication, in this case two bits, one of the four states is what you have to communicate, is necessary for success. If I don't communicate anything, the outcome is this with a quarter probability mixed with this, mixed with this, mixed with this, and it adds up and you can check it to a complete mess, identity. Bob doesn't still have anything at this stage. So the classical communication is really necessary and sufficient, of course, for, for maximum fidelity. So, so again, you know, you cannot really get more out of this uh, than, than you expect from, from relativity. And now I want to discuss with the remaining part a little bit about that. Um, again, it looks spooky. It looks like you are now really getting something across. Uh, but in fact, uh, and th there are numerous discussions, and I think, again, some of you have asked me about this uh, before. There are numerous discussions about, about, so where does the information travel? You see, again, as a physicist, here is mathematics stop here, stops here. And if we, we were really mathematicians or engineers, I would give you a, a book of problems this big, and I would just send you to solve it for the next three months and come back and do the exam. But we are physicists, we don't do these things. We are here to understand things, you know what I mean? Um, so, um, so basically, if you really think about this protocol here, you can now say, okay, there is another weird thing about this. I've got infinitely many bits of information hidden in these amplitudes, in some sense. So this could be some number like 0 0.7359, whatever, and it could have one zillion digits. And if I communicated that number to you over the phone, I'd be sitting there until I'm blue in the face. It would take a huge number of bits for me to communicate that to you. With one unit of entanglement, two qubits, which is insignificant compared to infinity, and with two extra classical bits, I can communicate infinitely many bits hidden here. How come two plus two is infinity? How does this add up? Where does it travel? So people would say, oh, surely it travels through the classical channel. I mean, nothing can travel through entanglement. But then you really have only two bits. I mean, how do two bits convey infinitely many bits? And this led some people to say, well, I think this quantum entanglement channel conveys the rest of it. And it really, you should think of it as a channel. But it's very difficult to say how this conveys, uh, conveys information. It really, it just, it's, you cannot do the ac accounting properly to get this number out. And I think this led people to, to propose all sorts of amusing things. I think there are, there are really many uh, amusing explanations of, uh, of this kind of stuff. One is based on this um, famous, trans so every interpretation of quantum mechanics will now give you a different answer to exactly what I'm asking. So it is a matter of prejudice. Uh, and probably it means we shouldn't even go beyond that and, and take it too seriously. But basically, there are two interesting ways as far as I'm concerned. One is, uh, one is the so-called transactional interpretation. It's a guy called John Kramer. I dislike this interpretation, but I'm mentioning it because it's very amusing in the context of life. So I, I don't take it too seriously. I don't know how many people take it too seriously. But, um, but basically, he wanted to explain entanglement in the first place. You know, here is something that generates entangled pairs. And he would say, can I have some a little bit more mechanistic view of what entanglement is? I mean, these correlations, how can I really view that? And somehow, he has this explanation of hidden variables which are highly non-local. They are non-local in the sense that if you think of this as your time axis, you know, you generate your entangled pair of photons, like down conversion or whatever else you do. What you imagine now is that this guy communicates, goes backwards in time, a little bit like a positron going backwards in time, electron, Feynman path integral kind of stuff, and I think that's the way he thinks of this. Um, and then he says, and then this guy communicates by going forward in time with this guy. So he somehow really gives you a hidden variable. But it's, of course, highly non-local because it goes forwards as well as backwards in time. And once you allow these things, probably you can do anything you like in some sense. But the beautiful thing, as far as teleportation is concerned, is that you have now a very nice 
way of imagining what happens there, even though this is most likely not at all true, but it's a nice story. And we like nice stories even when they're wrong. So here is the state psi. And now it encounters one of the entangled particles. It gets hooked to it and travels backwards in time, gets to the origin, and then it comes out forwards in time. So teleportation is nothing but one particle going forward in time, coming to Alice, going backwards in time, meeting the entangled pair and emerging forward in time. And you can see now that you actually don't have to do any calculation. You can see how psi emerges on the other side in one go. It's nice. It's probably fiction, but it's a, it's a nice fiction. So do you believe, is this an explanation? See, Kramer would say, I'm deeply satisfied with this. Are you satisfied with things going backwards and forwards in time? I don't know. Depends on your psychology. The second thing is to say nothing travels to, through entanglement. And that's, I'm going to go in that direction a little bit now in some sense. The second one says you're actually using the wrong version of quantum mechanics in which these things look like entanglement communicates something and so on. And this is due to a guy called David Deutsch, the same Deutsch who came up with quantum computing. What he basically says is if you write the whole thing in Heisenberg picture, in which there are no states, or states don't evolve, if you like. You can choose whatever you like as your initial state because that's your state forever. And if you only think of observables as evolving now, and you go through the whole teleportation, you will see that actually nothing happens until Alice really sends the two classical bits. And the quantum information, the amplitude, travel exactly through two classical bits. You can see how this happens. That's interesting. So basically, so basically, as a result of that, you really don't even have to think of this as an entangled state in some sense that they share, because you can start with whatever state you like. It's the operators now that carry entanglement. If you go through the whole process in terms of operators always using the same state, you somehow see that this is what happens. So this is interesting. We know that the two, inter the two versions of quantum mechanics, Heisenberg and Schrodinger, are the same, but somehow there are claims that they actually lead to different, uh, different realities, if you like that, uh, that word. I will stop here as far as that's concerned. What I want to say now is the following. The, so what's the logic behind this fact that nothing travels through entanglement? The logic is that if I really delete classical communication, I cannot do anything. And that's the proof I want to give you now. Um, and I think... Basically, you have it immediately because, um, because, uh, because you know uh, about CP maps. So imagine now that Alice and Bob share whatever state they like. I don't care. Entangled, not entangled. They have some general state rho A, B. And imagine that Alice does whatever she does on her state A. And you know that what this is now is some completely positive map. But Bob doesn't do anything. Okay? So basically, um, what Alice is going to do is some map AI, these are the outcomes on Alice's side. She's going to deliberately choose some outcomes, and then she's going to see whether Bob can read the outcomes out because they share entanglement. That would be the spooky stuff. She doesn't say anything to Bob. She does measurements, and Bob says, oh, I know you just did sigma x or rotation or whatever else. So of course, this, this should not be possible. So Bob doesn't do anything here. AI dagger identity means Bob really is not in the game at all. And what I want to compare now is the reduced density of Bob's before Alice did her operation and after. And I will show you that it's one and the same. And it's trivial, it's two lines. So whatever Alice does, she brings in the rest of the universe, evolves it unitarily, non unitarily. She cannot change the state that Bob has. And this is deeply satisfying. The only way you can change something on Mars, you know, change the rock from one place to another, is to go there in a spaceship and move it physically yourself. You have to go through every point between here and Mars, and that's known as locality. Everything in physics is, is local in this sense of that word. Charge is conserved in a local way. When a charge disappears from here and one appears here, that doesn't contradict conservation of charge, but it contradicts locality of physics. The only way that a charge can disappear here and appear here is if it's gone through every point 
between these. Okay, that's called conservation of current. There's a nice diffusion equation concerning current. Every law of conservation in physics is local. There is no magic. That's the theory in general, in every branch of physics, including quantum mechanics. Very powerful. So basically, <laughs> what is the state of bots after Alice has done all of these things? Well, chase Alice out. Let's see. And now, as before, you know that this sum can come out. Because I'm chasing over Alice, I can permute Alice's operators under the trace any way I like, and it's still the same result. So this is certainly the same as sum over i, trace of a i. I'm going to move this guy over here. So identities, let's even forget about them, that they're there, they're really not doing anything. So I've got a, a i dagger a i, tensor identity for Bob, if you like, row a b. It's the same as the above. Now I put the sum back. I say, thank you for being outside for a while. Now, now you're useful again. And the sum of all of these guys here is identity by definition of a CP map. All this is is trace of identity times identity times the state itself, the original state, which is the original reduced density matrix of Bob. The same as before. Alice did anything. But now I allow Alice to do anything that's possible according to quantum mechanics. Three-line proof that there is no instantaneous communication in quantum mechanics. There is no magic. It's a local theory. Really local. I'll talk about Bell's inequalities and non-locality as well. It's a different non-locality. It means something completely different. It should not be confused. So when David Deutsch wrote this paper and said quantum mechanics is local, lots of people jumped up and down saying, well, what about Bell's inequalities? It's really a semantical issue. It's not the same locality as the other. You have to define it properly. So you really cannot, cannot change the state on the other side. And now I'm on to, I think I have, a, I have a few more minutes, to basically just show you one of those fun examples where I'm going to assume that I can do something, and then suddenly you will see that actually I can communicate uh, um, superluminally, if you like, or instantaneously even, and so on. So this is, this is a fun example where I can assume that I can clone. I mean, it's very, it's very, it's, it's very bad assuming something that's not true. This is very well known to philosophers, that, that if you assume that something is not true, you can derive anything as a result. You know, if you assume 1 plus 1 is 3, then you can derive uh, any wrong conclusion from that. So you have to be careful how you do this, and I will try to define it um, as, as best as I can. Uh, assume uh, that we, uh, we can clone, uh, which means really that whatever you give me, and I have my cloning machine here, I really can go into, into this state. I mean, we know we cannot do that for all size. Um, we can only do for two orthogonal size, but, but let's assume we can do it. Let's assume there is a theory that allows you to do that. And now the question is, can I really use this to somehow communicate, um, communicate faster than the speed of light? So the message of this guy is whatever outcome Alice gets, whatever Alice does here, cannot be read out by Bob, because he always has the same density state. You cannot change it unless you act on his, on his system. So, so, but cloning changes this whole thing, and, and here, is, here is how it changes it. So, 0, 0, plus 1. Let's imagine Alice and Bob again, you know, start in this state, as, as always. And what Alice is going to do is cryptography. In the sense that Alice is going to say, I'm going to make either measurement in the Z basis, or I'm going to make a measurement in the X basis. This is very artificial, what, what follows now. And I'm going to wait and see whether Bob can pick up which, which one I did. Um, of course, you already know quantum mechanically that if she measures in the 0, 1 basis, Bob's state is going to end up being half 0 plus half 1. If she measures in the plus minus basis, 0 plus 1, 0 minus 1, Bob is going to end up with 1 half plus plus one half minus. See, now this is 
this beautifully links back to the decomposition of the density matrix. And if it's the same state, even though it's a different decomposition, you cannot discriminate. This is the same as that. If you expand these guys, all the off diagonals will cancel out, and this really is the same as that. I'm restating a simple example following from that. So Bob always has the same density matrix, no matter whether Alice measures 0, 1, or she measures uh, plus minus. He cannot tell which measurement she chose, because his state is always the same. Now comes the trick that I'm assuming a fictitious world, and Bob brings in an extra ancilla qubit. And Bob says, I have the cloning machine. God gave me a cloning machine. I know quantum mechanics doesn't allow it. God came to me, said, here is the cloning machine. OK, I promise. And what does he do with the clone? Well, he's got, he's got this extra ancilla bit here sitting in some state 0. I mean, it doesn't make any, any difference really what this state is. And if you clone in this basis, so you see, now it's going to allow you to discriminate bases, but we know this is not possible, and that's what's going to kill it. It's really so tightly packed. Whichever side you attack it from, you get back to the same thing. So what is the state here? This guy just becomes 1 half 0, 0 plus 1, 1. Because 0 is cloned into 0, 1 is cloned into 1. Okay? Here is a classically correlated state, as we called it before. This guy, which is the same quantum mechanically, becomes plus plus, plus minus minus. And if you expand this, not the same state. I can discriminate them now. Bad. Okay? Hence, I cannot clone. Okay? You can expand it now. It looks a little bit like a mystery, but I, but I promise it is really. This state, when you expand it, reduces to that, but this guy, does not reduce to that guy. This guy contains bits like 0, 1, 0, 1, and 1, 0, 1, 0. This guy doesn't have that. So there are two different physical states. And if you have sufficiently many copies of this, you can figure out what it is that Alice did without Alice telling you anything about it. And this is really something genuinely super okay? So there is no way you can do this kind of stuff. Um, again, there are many variants of, of these kind of games, and I think uh, we will talk about it throughout. Now, um, I have a few more minutes to really uh, to really start talking about about entanglement in general. And like I said, I'll I'll try to start with a historical perspective, and, and that's the one that we physicists like as well, in some sense, and that's what motivated us to think more about it. And then I'll th then I'll really try to dedicate a few lectures to the way that we think about it now. And, and again, we see that things like dense coding, teleportation, and then uh, certain very versions of quantum computation, the so-called cluster state quantum computation, if you, if you see this kind of stuff, it really is just a generalization of teleportation. And you can show that if in cluster states you have no entanglement, you can also never execute anything better than with a classical stochastic computational machine. So again, entanglement becomes a, a resource there. Whether entanglement is a resource in normal computers, dynamical ones, we still don't know. This is still an open question and an exciting one as well. There's lots to be said uh, about that. But basically, there is an awful lot of protocols where we know for sure that entanglement is directly uh, equal to fidelity. So given that I'm talking about this now, you can also say, what if I don't have a maximally entangled state here? I'll, I'll go into quantifying entanglement as well using Charles theory. I'm, I'm using it very loosely now. So I'm saying if these coefficients are not the same to each other, with each other, 0, 0, and 1, 1, then we, we think this is less entangled. And I'll give you uh, the view of correlations and mutual information why we think this is less entangled. Uh, but then you can show that the fidelity with which, so then you get some other state, not the input state itself. And then you can show that the fidelity, namely, you know, the overlap between psi uh, and psi dash, what you get out, is actually a direct function of the amount of entanglement in this state. Just like in dense coding, if you don't have any entanglement, you don't get anything better than classical fidelity, and otherwise you do, and it's one-to-one -one 
correspondence. So, so, so basically, history. A little bit of history. I think just a few minutes to mention that, and then, and then we'll talk much more seriously tomorrow. Okay. So, so historically, all of these things, uh, you know, all of these ideas somehow emerged from 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 the wonder that, that people like um, Einstein, I guess, he was the main driving force in, in, initially, had about the normality or the apparent normality and the funny things you can do with entanglement. And he had all sorts of interesting words to describe to describe these things. So one was to do with genuine randomness, where he said, you know, God doesn't play dice, I don't believe these things, and stuff like that. All of this is related to some, in some sense to entanglement as, as well. And then the spooky action in the distance was his response uh, to, to, to being able to manipulate EPR pairs and estimate position and momentum at the same time and so on. So I'll, I'll try to go a little bit through this just to give you the background. And of course this is all, all very old fashioned because you've got a new perspective on a, of entanglement. You know that this can be done in practice and there is, there is no, there's nothing inconsistent at least with, with this kind of picture. So, so what, what Einstein, what Einstein what Einstein said is the following. Actually, I don't even know whether I have a, a good answer to that. Again, it's a very interesting way of talking about how unusual this is. Uh, Einstein, Einstein started by saying, if I had an, he used continuous variables, basically um, infinitely many degrees of freedom, but you can cast it in this way. What Einstein said is, I know that I cannot uh, measure simultaneously two complementary observables. So I cannot give you the value of your spin in the z direction at the same time as giving you the x direction. These guys don't commute. It's a mathematician's way of saying this. Um, and, and basically, physically, it just means I cannot tell you that the spin is up in the z direction and at the same time is up in the x direction. It just cannot be done, quantum mechanics. And now Einstein used this logic against to turn quantum mechanics against itself, which to him would mean that it's inconsistent. It doesn't even make sense on its own, the theory. And he said, and he's going to be using logic like that, you know, that you cannot really do anything instantaneously with entanglement. So then it's got to be something else that's wrong with quantum mechanics. See, that, that's a really interesting way of, uh, of trying to expose it. So basically what he said is, he said, imagine that, um, imagine that Alice and Boba are again very far apart and imagine that um, Alice wants to know the sigma z value of Bob, but at the same time she wants to know the sigma x value of Bob. Of course that's not allowed by Heisenberg's uncertainty principle. But Einstein says, look, I mean, here is a simple way of doing it. Uh, Alice just measures sigma z and she's going to get either 0 or 1. But because this is correlated, complete, maximally correlated, she knows that when she gets 0 for her system, uh, Bob has got to have also 0. And when she gets 1, Bob has got to have 1. So by measuring your qubit in, the, in, the, in this basis, you can tell immediately what the value is for Bob's qubit. Okay, so that's, that's it. But because you're far apart, this should not interfere with anything on Bob's qubit at all. There shouldn't be any interference there because nothing can travel faster than the speed of light. I mean, we even have a formal proof, like I said, within quantum mechanics itself. And then he says, all Bob needs to do is now measure sigma x. Since this qubit is untouched by Alice's measurement, she's very far, all he needs to do is measure sigma x. And he will get plus or minus. So he will know that it's in plus state. Alice will know that it's in the zero state, for example. And look, we've determined both sigma x and sigma z without any trouble because we're very far apart. There is no, there is no uh, uncertainty principle. But quantum mechanics says you cannot do that. So it's got to be inconsistent. Okay? So we now know it's not inconsistent. But if you think about this, actually, you can really spend a long time thinking about it. And, and it's not clear where the problem is. Okay. So Bohr replied immediately. Bohr was very nervous. He 
he read this paper and he said, gosh, what am I going to do? He had two good postdocs and he started dictating a physical re review paper immediately in reply. And the reply says it's not inconsistent. I mean, it's as simple as that. There's not, it's a vacuous paper in many ways. <laughs> the reply says, look, if you go through it, it really works like you say, and it's not inconsistent. That's quantum mechanics. Sorry. That's it. But it is a bit funny. I mean, somehow it's, you, you're almost violating the spirit. You're not really violating uncertainty because you can show mathematically that there is no knowledge. But somehow you, you are doing something funny. Okay? So that was the first one. And of course, this, um, this prompted sh the famous Schrodinger guy to say, uh, to say um, well, there was another piece of Bohr's reply to which Schrodinger was referring because he really disliked Bohr's way of thinking. Bohr, 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 in some sense, was, was, was what people would, would call a, a pragmatist or an instrumentalist or a positivist or whatever else you call it in philosophy. And he said, after all, actually, these are small guys there in quantum mechanics. Why are you even trying to describe and think what are they really doing? What matters is what we observe, and that's always consistent with what's going on. These are small guys. I mean, we don't even see them. We have to translate them into the real world, and that's it. And then comes a killer paper from Schrodinger. It's the Schrodinger's cat paper, of course, which says not quite like that, actually. It's a bit more serious than that. It's not microscopic. So Schrodinger is actually the person who started the field of microscopic environment, in all honesty. So I should be citing this paper all the time. So what he said is, of course, what's immediately obvious is that if a small system couples to a large system, and if the small system is in some kind of superposition, then the large system will join into this superposition immediately as well. And you cannot escape from that logic. So even though you may think that you can brush away issues like Einstein, Einstein's by saying, God, ah, this is some small world, I don't have any direct contact with it, so okay, it's weird, but I still can describe it nicely. You can't quite be saying that if I show you that the whole world is actually quantum mechanical, including the wave function of your own body, Niels Bohr. Okay, that's almost what he was writing there. He didn't phrase it quite like that. Okay. So his experiment, of course, was the famous one. Uh, and, and he said, you know, imagine that I have a system that's in some kind of superposition uh, state. So he imagined an atom that would decay radioactively. And if you look at it before the final product of the decay, then you have a, 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 an amplitude that it decayed, an amplitude that it didn't decay. And then he said, if it, if, it, if it didn't decay, then all is fine. But if it does decay, it breaks um, a, a bottle with poison inside. And if you enclose the whole thing in a lab with a cat, uh, then of course the cat dies if the poison is out, but it doesn't die if the poison is not out. And suddenly the cat has joined the whole superposition. And it becomes highly entangled at the level of the whole lab. And Schrodinger says, surely this is now seriously funny. I mean, can this really happen in the real world? So, so this requires doing things that I started saying before, that actually we should legitimately think about quantizing a, a glass bottle with poison and the cat and the experimental is doing experiments and everything else. Okay, so that's, that's the way we would like to test the world. So here is this, um, here is this uh, bottle in some, in some state B, and here is the, the, the cat in some state being alive, if you like. That's what Schrodinger said. Uh, and then what he says is that in this case, the bottle stays as it is, and the cat stays alive, so that basically leads to zero B, if you like, uh, alive. But if the bottle is uh, broken, if this is out there, the, the, the radioactive particle, then the, the bottle is broken and the cat is dead. So you really have alive and dead as part of the same microscopic superposition or microscopically entangled state. So it's not a, it's not a quirk of microscopic objects that you cannot see. You can easily amplify it to anything you like, and then it really becomes interesting. What's your interpretation of a state like that? Do you think that can exist or not? Um, and of course, we are going in the direction of, of starting to believe that, yes, it can exist. I mean, as a, as a physicist, you know, you don't want to enter 
a discussion of what it means to be dead and alive. I mean, I don't even know what it means to be excited and ground in, in many ways. And I think being dead and alive is a serious issue. You know, it's coupled to biology, psychology, whatever else. And we really don't know how to phrase the question. But what we can do is, is create these kind of states with billions of atoms. So we can say, I've got one atom in a superposition like that, and then I've got billion other atoms. You know, here is a state of billion other atoms, so tensor product, you know, billion times. And then they can join in in the superposition in the same way that cat joins in as the dead and alive, in the sense that you can have all billion atoms in the state zero, or all billion atoms in the state one. And the only difference is that cat has 10 to the power of 23 atoms rather than 10 to the power of 9. It's exactly the same point I made before. So why do you think there will be any difference between Schrodinger's scenario and this scenario? So we really are starting to scale this gap, and we are climbing up. And slowly, I guess, we'll be superposing more interesting things than billions of atoms. So in a way, we are actually starting to, to think that, that th this was quite visionary in some sense. Rather than exposing quantum mechanics and saying it's, it's, it's even more weird than, than what you're saying, somehow we're starting to really live with this. And, and already, of course, we can, we can, we can do objects like this uh, quite easily. And so there was lots of discussion. So Schrodinger came up with a state like this and said that on a live cat and so on. And then, and then after that came Bell. So none of this was really a completely, lots of these were semi-philosophical arguments, not quantifying the weirdness. You know, Schrodinger didn't say this is 0.75 units weird and 0.25 it's okay, I can understand it. The first person who did that was John Bell. He said, I'm actually going to tell you really how weird it is. Let's measure things, because that's what we scientists love doing. And I think I probably don't want to take you through that, because it's going to take more than 10, uh, 10 minutes. So I'm going to stop here, and just remember that where we pick up tomorrow are bell, uh, uh, bells inequalities. One announcement to make before, before we break up, or before we have questions, is that talking to Marcelo, we actually thought that it would be a good idea to have one or more sessions of questions and answers about the course or beyond the course uh, that is outside of just this afternoon schedule. So one suggestion, and I think we'll get back to you with the venue, is Tuesday between let's say 10 and 1 o'clock in the morning. So let's say Tuesday 10 o'clock, hopefully this room is going to be free, but if not I will announce tomorrow which room is free. At 10 o'clock Tuesday I will be here and come and ask me any question you like. So I'll be here for 15 minutes. If I see absolutely no interest or apathy, then I will just walk away. You know, I will assume everyone is absolutely happy and understood everything. Otherwise, I'll be sitting here and really waiting for your questions. So it's not a standard lecture, but it really is questions and answers. And come with any questions and answers. You, cannot, you don't have to just ask me about this topic. If you think something else is interesting in that direction, just come and, come and talk to me. Is that a good uh, idea? But now, no more questions within 10 or 15 minutes that the camera will ask. <laughs> um, you convinced us that uh, we're only at quantum mechanics. Uh, all uh, it needs this, this uh, positive effects. And uh, if, if you apply this, this uh, logic, you mean that uh, we uh, never change this. However, when you go to part states, you have uh, changed uh, things. Uh, of course, it's, uh, this, this one half is the uh, um, probability uh, times the, the uh, yes. states in which you can. So how do you reconcile Yes, the, the teleportation only changes the state at the output once the classical information arrives about the outcome. Otherwise, exactly what I said before, that if you don't do that, then you have to average one quarter of each of the possible outcomes. And that gives you completely mixed state, which was the same that you started with before. So without classical communication, the initial state is like that. And Bob's state is really 1 half 0 plus 1. 
And up, if you don't communicate between Alice and Bob, even though Alice makes a measurement here, if you don't communicate the outcome, you've got exactly the same state. It conforms perfectly within this picture. This captures teleportation. These would be your these measurements here would be your projected measurements onto Bell diagonal states, if you like. So it's really classical communication is crucial. Without any classical communication, you don't change the state at all. If you average over all four outcomes. Each of the outcomes looks deceptively as though you did something and looks related to the initial state, but actually if we take the average, uh, the amplitudes completely cancel out. You get a maximum mixed state. No trace of the initial A and B. Really is interesting. So it's it's okay with the, with the proof. Uh, so I was thinking something like this. Uh, you uh, for for some reason uh, you 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 have uh, an observable uh, and uh, the state that one of these at least one of the states that is going to be uh, at, at the end of the uh, process is uh, an eigen uh, vector of this operator. Yes. And then. Um, The problem is that you really cannot control that. You know, if, if Alice could deterministically project, and if she could say, I, you know, I really want it to be 5 plus, if, if you could move that away from the quarter by any number, you'd be fine with, with this argument. But the fact that it really is one out of four chances equally kills any possibility of communicating, even the smallest amount of information about A and B. It's really interesting. I had a, I had one of my, my nicest experiences was when I went to Greece to give to give a lecture and, and I arrived there and they almost started to hug me basically and I thought why are you so enthusiastic about my visit? And then they introduced me to a second year undergraduate student who didn't even have a course on quantum mechanics, but he taught himself quantum mechanics. And he was coming up with all sorts of arguments like that with the loopholes why you can actually do it. And none of these other guys in Greece, they were not experts in quantum mechanics, they could not see where the problem was. So they were in desperation. He had zillion ways of violating uh, relativity. <laughs> then, they, then they introduced me to him and they said, you sort it out, please just talk to him. Take one day and talk. <laughs> You know, he was getting more and more elaborate. I would say, here is what the problem is with this scheme. And then he would double the number of photons and so on. All of this hides within very simple statement like that. But if someone shows you a particular protocol, it's sometimes very difficult to figure out where, I mean, of course, if you spend enough time, you will. It's a little bit like violating the second law. You know, someone shows you an intricate machine with all sorts of things, and they claim that they can get something out of nothing. And how you shoot it down is very difficult. But I would say it all boils down to this very simple statement that actions here have absolutely no effect over there, i.e. they don't change the state of the rest of the universe. So if I act on this pen, I literally only affect the pen. The rest stays the same until, you know, the pen leaks photons and they travel somewhere else and then, of course, this is all fine. It, it, yeah. I think your feelings are very similar to the feelings of all of us in physics in some sense, hence all of these historical paradoxes and so on. It does look very weird, so how come you know, I can't do this? Yeah. I wanted to ask you about the superlearning of communication. Uh, you said in the beginning that you would be very careful to not operate the law of uh, classical logic, uh, the quantum limit. How did it? How? Why is that not only? Why is that not only the law, the classical logic? What, 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 what else is there? Ah, I see. What, uh, what, what else is there is that I really allowed something that you cannot quantumly do.